OnePassword recently announced the latest version of their password manager for the Mac. It didn't go down too well. But today, I got to speak to two key people from OnePassword to get the inside story. Welcome back to Marketless Reviews. Thank you for subscribing if you have, and if you haven't subscribed, the button is just down there. So a couple of weeks ago, OnePassword, which is this fantastic password manager for pretty much every platform you can think of, announced the latest version of OnePassword for the Mac. It's called OnePassword 8, and this caused a bit of a stir for two reasons. The first reason was because they've moved over to something called Electron, which is basically the, the back end of OnePassword 8. And the second reason is because they've moved over to a subscription-only model for OnePassword password 8 so you won't be able to buy it outright anymore you'll have to pay for it ongoing and it has got some of well, quite a lot of their existing users quite angry and quite upset and I wrote an article about this a couple of weeks ago and it's gone bonkers I'll link to it in the video description but on medium for example it's had something like 95,000 views and it's been the most popular blog I've ever written, I think. That blog got picked up by a couple of people at 1Password, so I invited them onto this channel and got to speak to two very, very important people at 1Password. I had some pretty juicy questions for them. The idea really was to, to get some answers in terms of the Electron side of things, the subscription model they've moved to, and just to get an idea of where 1Password 8 is headed. It's a fascinating interview. I really enjoyed it. What you're about to see is a cut down version of it. There is a longer version, which you can get to listen to if you subscribe to my newsletter. I'll put a link in the description. I'll be sending the longer version out next week. But in the meantime, this is these are the best bits, really, of that interview. Hello, I'm uh, Andrew Beyer. I currently lead up um, our browser experience engineering organization here at 1Password. We started the company back in 2004, and then I think 1Password was released the very first version in 2005. It was supposed to be a very short project. I think we wanted to have, we planned about four to six weeks, I guess. We thought we'll spend some time on this small utility and then go back to web development. Basically, it shows how bad we are at, you know, uh, time estimates and also how i suppose popular it's been to be fair it's um you've, you've built such a huge user base so it's you, it was a very good idea wasn't it <laughs> yes it's certainly turned out to be a, something that people use every day and obviously the big news recently is one password eight which is um obviously coming to the mac and that's the primary reason for chatting to myself because I'm a, I'm a mac guy surrounded by macs but if you give me the the pitch for one password eight what's why is it such a big a big uh, release for for mac users for 1Password 8 on Mac and, and really all of the platforms, it is completely a rewrite. There was no code that was copied over, um, which I think Rustam said in, in a previous interview, like, nobody should ever do this. Nobody should ever decide, let's just rewrite all our apps. Like, it is a, it is a big challenge. But what we've gotten out of that is the ability to make some of those core fundamental changes that we need to kind of propel us into the future and bring a lot more kind of features to um, our users. And 1Password 8 is kind of the foundation for us to be able to start bringing those features. And most importantly, when we release one of those features, we can now release it cross-platform to every operating system, mobile, desktop, web. Yeah, I mean, w when you say it's redeveloped from the ground up, I can imagine Roostam's um, re reaction to that. And uh, Roostam, with with that in mind, bearing in mind what pa one password does, I, I guess one of the big concerns with that is, do you lose any of the all of that uh, experience and the the, you know, the many years of development you've put into making it so secure? Is there a danger that you lose some of that when you when you completely re-engineer the back end? It was important for us to rewrite it basically we couldn't it's like an old foundation so when you have an older house you know and you want to build a much bigger house on top of it sometimes the foundation does not work right so we we needed a brand new foundation for it and uh that's what we did with one pass of eight obviously the, the the platform you've gone with for this um is electron isn't it that's what underpins one password am i right in saying that so electron is what i've been calling it's kind of the vessel right so we have this back end kind of headless one password client that we've built for the front end we actually opted to use a web-based ui um, and the reason for that is a lot of users use one password in the browser where we can only use web-based ui a lot of users um, move before, between platforms. Like I just was watching a couple of your videos last night while I got ready for the show. You've been playing with Windows, right? So when you go over to Windows, if you're a 1Password user, you use 1Password 8, you're going to get the exact same experience. And, and the way that we can do that is with this web-based UI. It is 
the industry has borne out this is the way you deliver a cross-platform user interface, right? And so Electron is actually the least interesting part to us, but the most interesting part uh, in the news lately, that's the vessel. It, it literally just packages this web-based UI and it takes that, that backend code. And that is essentially the way we can distribute it on Linux, Mac, and Windows. Although we've looked at alternatives, Electron is the industry standard way to do this, right? Slack uses it. You said your um, users on Discord were talking about 1Password. They were essentially using an Electron app to talk about 1Password using Electron, right? Like this is the industry standard right now. Basically the safest bet, right? Like if, if Mac OS gets updated or Windows 11 comes out, Electron is guaranteed to be compatible basically because so many people use it. Most of the concerns that pe what we hear from people is people worried that with the new approach, 1Password becomes something like a lowest common denominator. So basically uh, that you, you're going to, like if some feature is only available, let's say you can only do that on Mac, but cannot do that on Windows, like one password will not have it, but that's absolutely not true. We're trying to make one password to be the best app on each platform. Great example of that real quickly is um, <clears throat> clipboard, right? So it's very important when you click copy on your password, um, we could have just used an Electron API to do that, right? Like we could have just added it to your, your clipboard, but instead we actually chose to write a bunch of stuff in Swift to use all of the same um, Mac OS clipboard features to make it um, both when you edit the field, you have secure input, but also when you copy that field, we set the correct attributes to ensure that um, the operating system knows that this is a secret and it shouldn't be shared with your clipboard manager or and, and those kind of affordances, right? It's better for our users, right? That's what they expect. I actually, we, we can unlock with Apple Watch, right? Like that's not an Electron feature. That's a feature that we have to actually interface with the um, system APIs. I think if you look at one of the key concerns, uh, it, it's to do with battery life, for example, on, on your MacBook, you know, there's there's a suggestion that moving over to Electron, as some other apps have done, I've seen the results of this with certain apps I use, can have a detrimental impact on your battery life. Is, is that something you guys have addressed? Is it something you're concerned about? You know, this is something that we did look at. Actually, users can use these tools, right? If you click on that battery icon in your um, toolbar, it will actually say these are the apps using significant amount of energy on your Mac. Thus far, I haven't seen anybody send a screenshot with one password being one of those um, or seen it myself, right? The web is where people use their computers nowadays, right? Like the majority of people, uh, whether it be via social media or really just getting work done, right? Google apps, Microsoft 365, this is where everyone is getting kind of work done. And because of that, the platforms, including Apple in the recent M1 architecture, right? I know you have an M1 MacBook Air. They optimize heavily to basically be able to deliver web content fast and, you know, lowest battery consumption ever, right? I think even way back, like, like 15 years ago, um, Apple has always talked about like, here's how much battery life you should expect when you're using a web browser. You know, they would, they would actually time their laptops in. This is how much battery life you can get, right? So the platform vendors are optimizing the heck out of the ability to basically deliver um, web-based UI. But what's funny is the majority of the kind of energy consumption we do is actually not out. It's, it's outside of ele um, Electron. It's, it's going to be the kind of backend code that we've written in Rust, which is compiled natively for your system. But we see what was happening over the past couple of weeks. Basically, people would find some a problem in the beta. And it's a beta app. We, we really had just a few hundred people using it. And every time people find a problem, they, they say, oh, if you didn't use Electron, that wouldn't be a ca the case, right? And the recent case where we had like a memory leak, one password had a memory leak. When we started debugging, it turned out that our memory issues were actually in Rust and Swift code. I think if we did the full rewrite of one password eight in any language, because it's a brand new app and it has more features, it would probably use more memory. What's in a way impressive about the reaction, which is probably probably sound like a strange word to use, um, is that just how passionate your users are. Like I say, I'm not a one password user myself, but my podcast uh, co-host Rob is he's been using it for 10 years and he was he was genuinely upset really um because he, he really respects you guys still does and he understands why you're doing a lot of this stuff but it's i think for someone like him it's yeah it's hard to adjust to that to this new this new world and i i get both sides of the coin completely i, I guess there's gonna be a lot of people now with one password seven thinking well how long can i use this for I'd, I'd much rather stick with this version of it what 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 are your plans with one password seven what's the roadmap for that in terms of support and how long is that going to be around 
to be honest is like, we're still in a beta process, right? So as long as you're still in the beta, obviously 1Password 7 is still the shipping app, the default download, we obviously support it. We used to all do customer service, including the developers, because we were small and we care so deeply about our customers. But we used to have the screenshot we had sent and be like, which one of the 1Password icons did you have? Okay, that's 1Password 3, right? And we still support that version to this day. We help get them upgraded. We put them, you know, in a place where they can continue using 1Password. So 1Password 7 will likely work until macOS makes a change that breaks it. We still know that there are still quite a few people left using the standalone license, and uh, we have a special program for them to allow them to make it easier to migrate. I think there's a special, very large discount for them to to start using the service, like basically trading their existing license for the service. That's a really good point. Yeah, yeah. If we can, we'll find that link and we'll put it in the video description, definitely, because I think you're right. There'll be a few people watching this who want to want to click that. So we'll definitely get that sorted. I know one of the one of the, the last concerns really was was to do with the uh, subscription model, and obviously you're moving to a subscription model only, so you can no longer purchase one password eight. How do you address that kind of concern? What what what's your what's your response to that, uh, Ristam? I could go through all the issues that we had with licenses in the past. If you probably don't remember, but we used to sell licenses for each platform separately. If you remember, the license price was quite expensive, so you have to put quite a bit of money up front. Whereas license, in many ways, is safer, right? You you basically, you use the app. If you use it, you like it, you pay for it. If you don't use it, you can cancel it up to like a month. Subscription versus license. Um, if you buy a copy of Photoshop, you can run it for five, six years, never have to update it, and probably be fine, right? If you're a very basic Photoshop user. But with a security software, like you really, you got to run the latest version, just like your web browser, right? Like never run an outdated web browser. Because people don't like the recurring costs, we actually offer gift cards not to give to someone, but to like, I'm going to just pay one flat fee for two years. A lot of the feedback we saw was that instant reaction, like Ugh, Electron, you know what I mean? And really wanted was people to go download it and try it. Go try 1Password 8. Um, and actually compare it to 1Password 7, run them side by side if you even want to, and, and look at the visual differences, the feature differences, um, see what you don't like about it. Because we launched the early access, I think, two weeks ago now. And since then, um, my friend Mitch, who's kind of in charge of products for the consumers, He's been looking at all the feedback we have gotten from those users and implementing some of the things that they're dissatisfied about, right? Like, oh, when I highlight in notes, I'm not getting the system accent color. Well, he's gone and added that. So um, I would say for the 1Password users that are going to upgrade eventually, now would be a great time to go give it a try. Find out the things that, that actually do bother you and let us know because ultimately we're building a product that we use, our families use, we use as a business, um, we, you know, honestly think helps the greater good of humanity. And so anything that the passionate users that that are dissatisfied with these changes um, can do to help us make them better for them and, and really humanity, we're absolutely willing to do. So there you go, guys. I really enjoyed that conversation. But the most important thing is, did it answer your questions or concerns about 1Password 8? Let us know in the comments. I can guarantee the guys at 1Password will be keeping an eye on the comments thread for this video. So if you've got any questions that are still rumbling around in your head, pop them into the comments section and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens. And equally, if they have kind of rested your, your mind and made you feel better about 1Password 8, let us know. I'd love to know if that's been the case. So again, thank you so much to the guys at 1Password 8. They were very, very cooperative with this interview. There was no pre kind of prep with this in terms of the questions. They didn't tell me what I could ask them and what I couldn't ask them. They just let me get on with it. So I'm really impressed with them. From a PR perspective, this doesn't often happen, trust me. They were absolutely fantastic. So thank you to 1Password. I hope it answered your concerns, but if it didn't, let us know in the comments. If you've still got some time, I'd recommend hanging around to the end of this video where I will put a link to a recent video I did about macOS versus Windows. Basically, I just want the whole platform wars thing to go away, and I kind of explain why that's the case and how I think we can do it. So keep watching for a link to that video. But in the meantime, thank you for watching this one, and I'll catch Catch you next time.